the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Friday, December 20th, 2013, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Well, King Caesar, uh, I'm sorry, I mean Obama, has issued another decree to try and help his disastrous health care plan. After millions of Americans learned what Obamacare really meant for them, that their plans were going to be canceled after all, he said, you know what, I wave my magic wand and I'm going to go ahead and lift the health mandate for those people since it caused so much controversy. Now he says people that lost their coverage will now be allowed to buy bare bones catastrophic insurance and that the law would usually limit that to those people who are younger than age 30. And then other people who didn't want to buy into that bare bones insurance could opt out completely without the threat of the fines being imposed on them next year like the rest of us who may or may not be insured. So of course this latest rule change can cause a significant instability in the market, but he doesn't care about that. He cares about the political backlash and the rest of those people there that are gonna, their seats are up for grabs in 2014. So he needed to slap another Band-Aid on that. But in another bust for Obamacare, it's a different kind of bust. This one comes from the Massachusetts State Police. They confiscated more than a thousand bags of heroin in a traffic stop. The strain of heroin? Obamacare. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really know what that means. I guess you got to be doped up to think that it's a good deal. Or perhaps he just, you know, maybe these drug dealers just wanted to get the word out to all of their junkie friends that there was some affordable health care out there for them or give the president some street cred. I don't really know why they would do that. But by now, I bet you have heard of the Duck Dynasty debacle and just the uproar that it's caused. Phil Robertson expressed his views on homosexuality and a and &E is wanting to pull him from the show and everyone, you know, the mainstream media is just, of course, labeling this as hate speech. I thought it was called freedom of speech or freedom to express, you know, what you feel. And of course, he's coming from a bi biblical perspective, so we have the right to uh, express ourselves, our freedom of religion. But what does this say for, you know, the Bible or the Quran? Because according to the Supreme Court, hate speech is permissible under the First Amendment unless it is likely to lead to imminent hate violence. And of course, those books are known for being infinitely more savage in their views about homosexuality. Now, regardless of how you feel about the gay lifestyle, I'm, I'm gonna go out on record and say, my very good gay friends, and I live in Austin, so I've got quite a few of them, they aren't really in an uproar about this whole thing. I mean, frankly, they think that someone that, that's that big of a star, like Phil Robertson, if, if he puts his views out there that people maybe don't agree with and it's causing this conversation, it's a great opportunity for us to have an open dialogue with people who have opposing points of view. But rather than allow that to happen, the state and the state-run media just want to shut it down and silence it and then keep us fighting amongst each other so that we can you know, get all tribal and not think that we are able to have conversations like adults. You can't force someone to feel how you feel or believe what you want to believe. And frankly, it's this whole political correctness that's gotten so out of hand that is threatening our freedom. And my, my view is actually backed up by uh, Camille Paglia. She is an openly gay social critic and a libertarian. And she says, you know, I speak with authority here because she was openly gay before the Stonewall, Re Stonewall Rebellion when it would actually cost you something like your life to be gay. She said, I personally feel as a libertarian that people have the right to free thought and free speech. In a democratic country, people have the right to be homophobic as well as they have the right to support homosexuality. If people are basing their views against gays on the Bible, again, they have a right of religious freedom there. So that is coming from, you know, an openly gay woman. And she is, again, saying, you know what, this isn't, this is America. If he wants to be that way, fine, let him be that way. If I want to be a gay woman, I'm going to be that way. This is, it's called freedom. But rather than reassert the fact that we have our First Amendment right to free speech and freedom of religion and to feel how we feel, they're trying to suppress it and just keep everything politically correct 
so that no one is offended and everything is just dull and bland. And again, like I said, uh, this political correctness is one of the greatest threats against our freedom that we have ever encountered here. And it needs to be stopped. How far are we going to let this go? Anthony Gucciardi has more on that. For thousands of years, empires and governments have come together and thought of ways they could quell the population with an ultimate weapon, an ultimate ideological tool. They have finally found the answer. Political correctness, the ultimate weapon, the ultimate tool of the establishment to quell the masses. Now, specifically, we're talking about things like the UK blocking pornography. You know, who's not for blocking pornography? If you're not, you must be crazy. You must be a horrible person that's addicted to porn. And, of course, they use that to overall mask the attacks on news websites that have pornographic ads, which is just a woman, really. And they use that to attack other websites for not even related reasons. But specifically speaking to the incident yesterday with the head guy from Duck Dynasty saying that he doesn't support homosexuality, this is actually key. Obama is using homosexuals and other individuals that are for the LGBT agenda, which, by the way, is fine, but he's using them. He's using them as a foreign affairs tool, a political weapon. He is using the fact that America cannot speak out against homosexuality as a tool to wage war on Putin, on Russia at large, and on the globe. Now, specifically, it was Jay Leno that said it was like Nazi Germany when Putin wouldn't allow the gays to go to the Olympics. Yeah, I don't know how it's different from, I, I mean, this is how it started Nazi Germany. Oh, the Jews, let's put them mm -hmm. over here. Oh, okay, well, I guess we'll, it, it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. And that spurred a little bit of controversy, just a little bit, but everyone would kind of said, yeah, you know, that's true. Obama knows that Putin has higher ratings than him on average. Obama knows that uh, even the American people were with Putin on the Syrian issue when Obama was funding the rebels that were beheading Christians and he wanted to go in and just blast Syria with weaponry. People said, hey, Putin might actually be right. Maybe we shouldn't go to war with Syria. Obama now is pushing this over and over again, and Jay Leno once more is comparing Russia to Nazi Germany for going against gays in the Olympics, and that is wrong. But the thing here is they're doing this as a political weapon. It has nothing to do with their support for the LGBT community. Obama doesn't care. Obama is using this as a tool. That's why he's sending openly gay uh, Olympians over for his delegate on, on, for the Olympics. This is a tool of assault. That's why this key guy from Duck Dynasty, who has 400,000 as of yesterday, probably 600,000 fans on Facebook saying, or on a support page saying reinstate him from the show, he was kicked off. He can't even say he's against homosexuality now. He can't even say that. I mean, the Quran says that. You know, the Bible in some ways says that, you know, it's not a good thing. Anything now that is against a certain population of the United States that is protected by the government is evil. But can you imagine? You know, the, it was the Storage Wars guys, they came out and they said, well, he just doesn't understand. Gay sex is great. You know, the anus of a man feels amazing. No talk about that. It was Drudge Report that linked to the Duck Dynasty story, and the top comment with 20,000 upvotes was basically saying this is politically correct insanity for him being fired. And it's not even about that, though. This is the ultimate tool. If you go against anything, they'll just brand you as a, a, you know, someone who's against homosexuals. For example, if, if you say, yes, I actually do believe in the Bible, well, they'll take something out of context and say, he's, you know, he's, he's insane, he's against homosexual, he's, he's crazy, or even the Quran or any, any of these books. You can say those people are not politically correct, they're evil. And that's what Obama is using to attack Putin and other leaders. The politically correct agenda is a weapon of war. Make no mistake. Anyone who is behind this and supporting this does not understand they're being manipulated and used. I'm all for homosexuals being treated equally and being treated well. Everyone should be treated well. It doesn't matter. That's the thing, though. It doesn't matter if you're homosexual or not. You should all be treated equally, all be treated well. And that's the whole spirit of freedom and humanity. But Obama is using this not as a way to help homosexuals. He is using this as a tool of war, and the establishment is using it to quell dissent. I'm Anthony Gucciardi, and I encourage you to research all of this and look into it for yourself, because it can be shocking in some ways, but many of you are being played, and many of you do realize this, but at the same time, we have to understand political correctness is a tool of the establishment. 
All right, well, coming up after the break, David Knight joins me in studio to talk about how the police are now brutalizing people who dare exercise their First Amendment right to protest. Symbols are powerful, and the globalists have hijacked the symbols of America. They've turned them into their own symbols. Well, we are restoring the idea of the true republic, not the counterfeit globalist empire, by promoting the icon George Washington and others. That's why we're rolling out on a 100% Made in America line of incredible pro-liberty apparel. We are repopularizing liberty. We are helping fellow Americans Americans rediscover what made this country great. We are the spirit of 1776. We are 1776 worldwide. We are all brothers and sisters in arms in the animating contest of liberty in the long march towards humanity's ultimate destiny of freedom. Visit madein1776.com today and vote with your dollars to promote truly made in America high quality products and promote the ideals of liberty. Alex Jones here to tell you about how you can help spread liberty worldwide while also enjoying what I have found to be the best tasting 100% organic coffee on the planet. For more than a decade, my favorite coffee has come from the high mountains of southern Mexico where the Chiapas farmers grow their unique shade-grown Arabica beans. We have now managed to secure these sought-after beans in a highly customized blend. Discover and try a bag of the Patriot Blend 100% organic coffee at InfoWarsLife.com. This coffee gives you a long, smooth pick-me-up for hours without the headaches and heartburn that so many other coffees give me personally. Hands down, this is my favorite coffee, and it's taken us years to secure connections directly to the Chiapas Mexican farmers. Drop by the site today, order a bag or two, and I don't think you're going to be disappointed. Available in original or with our immune support infusion blend, you will be supporting a free press, all the while enjoying a truly great-tasting cup of my favorite coffee. Available at InfoWarsLife.com. Welcome back. We do a lot of reporting here at InfoWars about the police state and how it has gotten insane and out of hand. Well, now there is even more reports of police who are literally getting away with murder and then anyone who would dare question them and, and press for further investigation of these murders, because that's what they are, they're bludgeoning them, they're beating them, they're saying you're going to have a peaceful protest against us, well, we'll show you who's the boss. So David Knight is joining me in the studio with more. So, David, what is the latest news coming out of North Carolina? Well, there was a peaceful protest of a 17-year-old who died in the back of a police car. Now, he had been arrested for a misdemeanor. Mm. He was handcuffed in the back of the police car and shot in the head. That was about a month ago. And last night, they had a vigil that went to the Durham Police Department, and that got very violent. It's about 150 to 200 people, and we've got a clip of that. Okay. They were clearly upset with the fact that people were out expressing themselves and upset over the fact that it appears that they murdered a 17-year-old child. They didn't really look like batons or nightsticks, but they were a little thinner and longer, and they were reaching over the banner, whacking people. So now they were holding this peaceful vigil for this young man that they believed was murdered by yes. the police. I yes. mean, somehow he was, he was searched, but yet managed to get a gun with him inside the back of the police car and shoot himself. Very improbable that you'd be able to do that with your hands behind your back. And he's only been picked up for a misdemeanor. This is something that is just maybe 30 days in jail max that he could get with this. This is very similar to a case that happened in Jonesboro, Arkansas mm -hmm. back in 2012. The police eventually got somebody that could reenact moving their hands underneath the handcuffs and pulling it around, but that also begs a question as to how this person could also hide the gun while they were handcuffing them, taking them into custody. And it's very similar to what we just saw happen earlier this week, where in Ohio, a fellow attempted a jailbreak, and when he was captured by the police, they were caught on the video camera saying, we're going to break your neck, we're going to have a party for you when we get back to the jail, and within an hour, he was hung in the jail, and the coroner says it was murder. Common sense says this is murder. Why, if somebody has a gun and they're a criminal, then the case of the Jonesboro, Arkansas case, the guy was a drug dealer or whatever. If he wanted to use a gun, why wouldn't he use it on these officers instead of on himself? But here we've got a 17-year-old who's been arrested for a misdemeanor. Right, exactly. It's nothing that extreme. And then the police here, they went to 
extreme intimidation tactics against these people who dared yes. to question the official story. Yes, tear gas, the whole bit, just like you saw in Dallas when you're protesting mm -hmm. against the shutdown of free speech. What's interesting about this is this is the second time they've done a vigil on the one month anniversary of this. Now they're going to come back again in January 19th. They're, they said they're going to be back protesting this. I hope they don't let this go. This is what's necessary is for people to stand up in mass when they see the government essentially getting away with brutality, getting away with murder. Right, and I'm going to be speaking with Amber Lyon later in the show. She covered another protest in Anaheim where they were protesting police brutality, and there that took a violent turn as well. So here we have another peaceful yes. vigil where there it's the same incidents, and it's it's almost like how dare you, you know, question us and question our authority? We are going to bludgeon you and literally beat you down if over you dare. and over again we see this. The UC Davis cop who sprayed people with pepper spray, even though they were handcuffed and in front of him. Mm -hmm. that that's the thing that really we should all be upset about. Doesn't matter what the protest was. We have protected under the Constitution. We have recognized that we have a right to address our government about grievances that we have. We have a right to protest. And they are using these over-the-top Gestapo tactics, over-the-top brutality and assault on people. And in many cases, like we see here, perhaps murder. So that needs to be investigated. Absolutely. And and you're right about that. It is it is a intimidation tactic. That's why they're really building up, militarizing our police force mm -hmm. so that we, we won't go to these protests and that we won't stand up for our rights and we won't speak out. We'll just cower in fear. Yes. As the man was saying, the they, they come up to the people holding a banner, reach over the banner, start beating them with uh, clubs or whatever it was, a different type of billy club that they had. Yeah. And of course, they turn out in full riot gear, which in and of itself is very intimidating because they're in full body armor. Armor, and they're allowed to beat you without with impunity if you try to resist then they really focus on you so, right yeah, yeah so very we concerning definitely need to but we want to see if they're going to exactly we want to see that they're going to continue to press this it looks mm -hmm. like the community is going to stand up against this and stand for this stand mm -hmm. for all of us actually so yes. we'll definitely keep our eye on this story as it develops yes thanks david all right, well, stay with us after the break because David Knight is going to be interviewing Karen Lamoureux. She's the woman in that viral video who destroyed Common Core in about four minutes. You're not going to want to miss this. The facts are in. The studies are legion. Sodium fluoride and other toxic members of the fluoride family are devastating the health and cognitive ability of the American people. So why are the social engineers adding it to the water? Simple. Dumb down the host population that the parasitic technocracy is feeding on. We may not have been able to get fluoride out of the water supply yet, but we can help to get it out of our bodies. I am extremely excited to announce the exclusive InfoWars Life Fluoride Shield Formula fusing six of the best documented ingredients from around the world to help the body remove not just toxic fluoride residues from the body, but a whole host of toxic substances. Let's take a stand against the globalist by blocking their poisons with Fluoride Shield. I use Fluoride Shield every day. Secure your Fluoride Shield and other pioneering formulations at InfoWarsLife.com today. Let's start cleansing our bodies now and support the InfoWar at the same time. That's InfoWarsLife.com. We're on the march, the Empire's on the run, and the InfoWars Army is standing strong. Wake up your family, friends, and neighbors and break the matrix at InfoWarsStore.com. Learn the truth and spread the message of liberty with the world's most comprehensive collection of books and documentary films. Maintain a healthy metabolism and energize your body to perform at peak health with Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Protect your family and be prepared with survival foods and emergency preparedness kits. And now you can drink safe water with your own ProPure water filtration system, which removes fluoride and other harmful chemicals from your family's water supply. Save 10% with the promo code WATER. So join the revolution, InfoWarsStore.com. Well, there's a video on YouTube that's going viral of a mother who went before the Arkansas Board of Education and devastated Common Core by illustrating the absurdity of one particular question, just one math question. And of course, you know that in 1984, 
It's the two plus two equals five is how they put forth their control over the process, the way that people think. The answer in objective reality is not important. It's control that's important. And Common Core is a way for the federal government to control curriculum nationwide. So joining us today is Karen Lamoureux of Arkansas, a concerned mother and a member of Arkansas Against Common Core. Well, that was an amazing video that we saw on YouTube. You really cut to the heart of everything with just one simple question, math question. And as you pointed out, if they did it with one step long division, it was the wrong answer. They were looking for a convoluted process. Can you tell us a little bit about that convoluted process? That's what I didn't understand. My, my understanding is that there are two things happening with the math methods being used in the Common Core standards. One is that they're using some everyday math and CGI math, which we've seen before. They've tried to mainstream these into public education before, most recently, I believe, back in the 60s, and, and did so unsuccessfully. Um, and the second issue with the math is that, uh, according to the National Mathematics Council, um, the Common Core math standards are two years, one to two years behind. So uh, you put all of that together and you get problems like the one that showed up in our fourth grade elementary school here, where rather than just using standard algorithm and taking two steps to solve a division problem, uh, they have these kids drawing out all of these diagrams and illustrations, which completely overcomplicates it and confuses them. And that, that particular problem, if you count every circle and every hash mark that they had to draw on paper, uh, was 108 steps. Yeah, and that was the uh, question I had about it. You said that if they just did one step long division, that was wrong because the process was important. Is that correct? That's just it. That's just it. And 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 the proponents and the people at the at the state level, you know, when I when I brought this to their attention by email before that meeting, they said, "Well, that's the teacher's fault. They shouldn't be marking it wrong." And they always want to throw the teachers under the bus. <laughs> so yeah. That's, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What, were they so interested in the process that it didn't matter if they got the right answer as long as they followed their process? That's correct. And, and really? that's what parents all over the country are communicating. You know, mm. we, we talk to each other via social media and by email and by phone. And, and it's not just our teacher. It's just, just not my school. Uh, parents all over the country with kids in third and fourth grade common core math classes are saying the same thing. Well, that's that interesting because they're marking it wrong because they're not using the proper procedure. They're looking for the execution of the method more than the answer. Wow, that that's interesting because in my introduction I mentioned that of course in 1984 George Orwell, it wasn't that. 2 plus 2 equals 4. That wasn't the correct answer. They wanted you to give them 2 plus 2 equals 5 if they told you that it was 2 plus 2 equals 5. It was the process. And that was really the, pro the process was really more about bending your will to the will of the central programmer. And that's the thing that we're very concerned about because this isn't just an Arkansas problem. As, as we all know, Common Core is an attempt to nationalize the curriculum and the teaching methods and to set all of that power in Washington. I remember when I was young, we had things called local school boards that actually really had power. And then we saw that power move from the local school boards to the state, then from the state to the federal government. And now they are really consolidating that. Can you speak to that consolidation a little? They are. In fact, the teachers are voicing to us in private that they have very little control over what's being taught in the classroom mm -hmm. anymore. And uh, just recently, uh, we're being told that uh, the, all of the textbooks are being done away with. And the teachers are now going to be given packets. I have yet to figure out where these packets come from. Uh, but they're getting packets, and they get them only a week or so in advance of, of teaching their units in the classroom. They're very much being scripted. And, yes. you know, for the proponents of Common Core who come out and say it's merely a set of standards, curriculum is up to the district, it, it's sheer propaganda. It simply isn't true. And, and when you ask teachers... Uh, their opinion in a public setting about Common Core, they're all going to tell you the same thing. They're all going to say, oh, it's great to bring our kids for the risk and the college ready, globally fine, because they have to have a loyalty to their employer. Uh, we have teachers locally here who have told us in private that if they say anything negative about Common Core, they've been told it would be considered insubordination. Wow. So that's, what, that's like mm -hmm. asking you know, someone who works for any other corporation 
to, to come out in public and blast the product that they themselves are trying to sell. These teachers have to make a livelihood. Uh, and, and so, you know, they're not going to come out and, and uh, try to disarm the Common Core Initiative when they've got their own bills to pay and mouths to feed at home. But well, I guess the... Believe from I guess the fact that they are being scripted. Yes, yes, and and they're being intimidated, as you mentioned. You know, it's not it's not insubordination; it's really intimidation that we see happening to the employees. I, I guess the thing that really concerns me is this loss of local control. And of course, if the state school boards, if the local school boards don't have any say so, of course the parents aren't going to have any say so in this either. So we see this centralization. And one of the bad things about the centralization is, is that if they get it wrong, like they do with this math process, then everybody gets it wrong. Whereas if you've got a decentralized system that you've got school boards in different areas and they make their own decisions, then you've got multiple approaches. And if you can't fix it in one area, you can move somewhere else where they've got it right. But here you've got really no say so as long as you're in a government school. Is that correct? That's correct. You really don't. And, and the way my understanding, based on what teachers are telling me, is that the way the Common Core standards are executed is that they're done in, in um, project-based learning, and they run in modules that run from six to nine weeks. And each module has a name to it. So some of the ones that we've seen here include patriotism, which mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation because those items weren't patriotic at all. If anything, they were anti-American. Um, and, and, or the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. They all have these politically charged uh, topics, and then right. every subject is tied to that topic hmm. for six to nine weeks, and now they're getting these packets of materials to teach from instead of established literature uh, that we've been using for, for generations and is trusted and tested. Well, it looks like they're uh, coming in with subjects that are not as controversial as history. They learned their lesson from the first time around when they tried nationalized curriculum. Now they're coming in with things that shouldn't be controversial like math, but as you brilliantly pointed out in your short presentation, but the thing we really need to be concerned about is the federal control. So thank you so much for, for coming in. We're out of time for today, but we'll Keep an eye on Common Core and please keep fighting for it in Arkansas. We need to see people all over the country get involved in the level of activism that you had. And I think maybe if everybody does, we can head this off. I thank you for having me. And for those whose interest is piqued and they're willing to do some more research on their own, there's a website that I highly recommend that parents go to, and it's called truthinamericaneducation.com. Very good. Thank you very much. Karen Lamoureux. Thank you. Well, this is happening everywhere in America. It's not just in Arkansas. Everywhere in America, the federal government is trying to take control of the educational system and thereby control our children through Common Core. And again, if you want to know more about that, the website she just gave is truthinamericaneducation.com. And if you want to know more about the deliberate dumbing down of America, which has been going on for quite some time, Charlotte Iserby wrote a book about that, what she saw at the Department of Education decades ago. Nothing has changed except they now have some new techniques and a lot of funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a lot of carrots and sticks applied to the state governments by the federal government in order to gain that control. Well, that's it for our news tonight. If you're a Prison Planet TV subscriber, however, stay tuned because Leanne McAdoo has an interview with Emmy Award winning journalist Amber Lyon. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. Well, joining me today is Amber Lyon. She is a three-time Emmy-winning investigative journalist and photographer. She exposed how CNN and other networks are paid by foreign governments to bring us sponsored content that makes them look good. Uh, she's literally put her life on the line numerous times. And then, of course, with her latest book, Peace, Love, and Pepper Spray, she has literally put her life on the line to report stories that are vital to the public in spite of potentially offending those networks that pay her. She's here with me today to talk about her new book, Peace, Love, and Pepper Spray. It chronicles modern protests in America. As well, she's gonna to talk to us about the state of media as it stands today. Well, Amber, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Sydney. I know it's nice and early there. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for having me on. It was uh, worth waking up for this interview. 
Well, so you said that you hope that this book is going to inspire people to stand up against corruption. So why does it why does it seem like people in other countries, like we see in Thailand and Brazil, Italy, it seems like they they don't have any problems standing up against the corruption in their in their in their country? Why do you think we're having such an issue with that here? Well, I think that in, over the past several decades, the mainstream media has really demonized protests. They've made protests seem like it's something that only hooligans do or, or bums and hippies and, and people that just don't have a real message. And, and we saw that with the Occupy movement when on September 17th, when occupiers hit the streets of New York, right away the mainstream media came out with stories just making them look plain silly. And so because of this demonization and this propaganda, I think the people have lost touch with the value of what protest means. And protest is and has been throughout history the common denominator for change in the United States. If you look at women's suffrage, you look at the American Revolution, um, gay rights, and, and every bit of change we've had in history has been a direct result of the people hitting the streets, voicing their anger, and, and telling the government that they want change. And so the purpose of this book uh, for me and, and the value in it and why I decided to spend a year traveling the country to, to uh, publish this was to remind the American people that protest is beautiful and protest is effective. I have protest coverage in the book of people who won. Um, the, uh, a group of retirees out in front of Occupy Century Aluminum, uh, their, their employer had taken away their health benefits and they camped out literally in front of the Century Aluminum smelter for nearly a year and got their health benefits back. Or these home foreclosure protests where people have been barricading themselves in front of their homes to keep the banks and effectively keep the banks from entering and foreclosing on their homes. So people are winning. Uh, throughout the country in protest, it's just being underreported by the media. And so that's another reason I chose to publish this book is counter propaganda to really remind people that if we want change, we need to stand up and make our voices heard. Right. And they do kind of want to silence how effective protests can be. And it seems like the police here have really started to, they're, they're militarized. So if you're going to go to an anti-GMO rally and you're a mother there with your three-year-old daughter who's like wearing a fairy princess costume to protest GMOs, you're being faced with these tanks, military tanks and police officers in full riot gear, uh, kind of an in intimidation tactic. Do you think that that's more, I mean, you you were in Bahrain, so how does that compare to a place like a police state like that? Well, unfortunately, the streets of the U.S., uh, when it comes to protests, are looking more and more like uh, the protests and the police response I saw overseas in the Middle East. And, and that's really unfortunate. And I think it's in part due to lack of mainstream press coverage and lack of public outrage. We should be standing up and actually protesting the police militarization at protests because it's gotten to a level of just absurdity. Uh, one time I was covering an anti-police brutality protest. This is a chapter in the book. and. Uh, all of a sudden, I look down the street and I see uh, a truck pulling down the street. On the back are these officers, police officers, dressed in full camouflage gear, wearing military boots, carrying weapons on their backs, <laughs> as if they're heading to war. Um, I actually named that chapter Afghanaheim because it, it was as if in Anaheim, California, these soldiers were headed to Afghanistan. Wow. And, and when people saw that, it really put a shock on, on the, the face of these protesters. And also, uh, for me as well, uh, to the level authorities are going to, to intimidate protesters. This was a protest that consisted mostly of women and children and unarmed men. And, and the police were coming in dressed like they're headed to war. And so that should disturb all of us because it is an effort, I believe, to create a chilling effect, not only for uh, protests, but also for journalism as well. And it's something that, uh, that I think obviously has to disturb some of these police officers. And I'm wondering why more of them don't stand up and refuse to put on these ridiculous uniforms to, uh, 
you know, to police their peaceful citizens and really intimidate uh, people from exercising their First Amendment rights. And I saw an escalating amount of police militarization as I traveled the country photographing for this book. And I think that's something that should wake all of us up, that we really need to pay attention to this because we're not in martial law here, but, but it's looking more and more like we are. Right, and it was really underreported that you, as a journalist, uh, you were kind of on the other side of the riot police there, and weren't you actually fired upon? Was that in Anaheim that you kind of were, was it like beanbag bullets or something? Yeah, a, a wall of police fired on me, and um, and I was standing in the road photographing, and I, w I was in such shock. I just stood still for a minute and then realized I was being, uh, a wall of police were uh, firing less lethal rounds at me literally straight at me. And I had to run and hide between two trucks for several minutes to avoid being hit. And they call them less lethal rounds, but as I've seen overseas, they can kill. If one of those um, rubber bullets hits you in, in the um, chest, it could uh, pierce your heart. Potentially, it could give you a concussion if it hits you in the head. So they are very dangerous. And the police were literally just indiscriminately walking down the street, bam, 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 firing in these neighborhoods. And um, and when I came out, when I emerged from the trucks, I told the officers that I was press. I started yelling press. And one of them looked at me and said, don't you know how to cover a riot? You need to do it from back here behind mm -hmm. the police line where there was literally a pile of journalists just back there behind the police line, only seeing the protests from the police point of view. And because I was able to submerge myself with the protesters, I was able to photo document some pretty um, stark images of police brutality and, and uh, injuries of pedestrians who just happened to be walking down the street who were hit by this um, irresponsible behavior by the police department. So it was very important for me to be out there, but I, I was fired on as well. And I really felt the fear these poor citizens of Anaheim felt as the, the police just kept walking up and down their streets um, at firing upon these residents. And I, I was also really disturbed at the lack of national outrage and the lack of mainstream media coverage of this event because it was one of uh, the most disturbing events I've ever covered in my career. Right, and it's supreme irony there. You're at an anti-police brutality yeah. protest <laughs> and they're firing upon a journalist that's there. And I'm sure the reports that came from those people standing behind the riot police were just how they were so heroic firing upon these wild protesting hippies or something out in California. How dare they stand up for our rights and try to protect us? Exactly. <laughs> the, the journalists were calling it riots when it wasn't riots. It was police firing on a group of peaceful citizens who had gathered to voice their anger at police brutality. And, and the media wasn't covering uh, an NBC news car was actually hit by these uh, projectiles. One of the drivers, he had come around the corner and he stopped because all of a sudden a wall of police were coming at him marching down the street. And I have a photo of him just ducking down in his car, absolutely terrified because the police had their guns drawn at him and, and they um, ended up hitting the corner of his windshield. And so I thought, as journalists, we need to be watchdogs on authority that NBC would have really raised hell about that on, on the nightly news um, that night, but they didn't. And, and to me, that was uh, emblematic of uh, overall the attitude toward the uh, press throughout protest to really stand on the side of authority instead of questioning authority, behaving more as puppets and lapdogs uh, than what their true roles should be as watchdogs. Right, well, we're seeing this again here uh, tonight. We just reported on the news about the peaceful vigil for the young man that was m mysteriously shot uh, in the back of the police car. They went to peacefully protest against the violence there, and then that took a—they were pepper sprayed, basically beaten down. Well, I, I think what's happening in police departments nationwide is when incidents of police brutality or suspicious uh, killings un under police supervision or, or officer-involved shootings happen, they don't really want uh, noise to be made about that. Mm -hmm. So 
so they want to suppress these protests because protests and vigils draw attention to uh, the police brutality and, and media attention especially. And so I think that's why these police departments really crack down on these with a, with a heavy hand. And what they should be doing is really entering the community and, um, and apologizing and saying, okay, how can we help? How can we further you know, improve our relationship with the public so they're not fearful of us? And, and instead, we're seeing them pull up to these protests dressed as if they're headed to war, just firing pepper balls and, and bean bags on residents who are, are fearful. I mean, could you imagine living in one of these communities where uh, in the book I cover Manuel Diaz, who is 25, just walking down the street in a residential neighborhood in broad daylight, and police approached him. And for some reason or other, he ran away, but he wasn't armed. And while he was running away, officers fired and killed him in broad daylight in the middle of someone's lawn in Anaheim, California. Now, can you imagine how these residents feel knowing that that's the way the police behaved? And, and there's a genuine fear amongst residents of, of police officers. And especially when after uh, police brutality happens, then they also act brutally in policing these protests. And I believe that's a, a direct result of them not wanting these protests. They want to intimidate the people to keep them from protesting or holding vigils because Vigils and protests shine lights on on the inappropriate behavior of these police departments. Well, and you you're never afraid to really get in there and put your life on the line. And does it ever just kind of make you want to just throw your hands up in the air? The fact that there's just so much complacency with the American people. It, it is disturbing, but I, uh, what really gives me a lot of hope right now is a lot of people are waking up thanks to the independent press. And, and I think people are really now able to just navigate the Internet and find out the truth once they realize they can't trust the mainstream media. So we're seeing overall worldwide this conscious revolution, this this. Uh, evolution of consciousness where people are starting to realize that they've been lied to or misled their entire lives and now they're seeking the truth and as people are absorbing this truth they are fighting back uh, one of the most prominent examples is syria uh, if we would have taken the official narrative for what was going on in syria we would have allowed another Iraq or Afghanistan, but because the people have had enough and now realize that they've been misled for so long, they were able to go on the internet and search for alternative media sources that were reporting the truth and that that's that Syria wasn't necessarily a black and white conflict. And perhaps the U.S. actually uh, had a hand in creating this conflict in the first place for other corporate interests able to realize that they fought back and said no way we don't want to enter Syria and so it's little moments like that that give me a lot of hope and and want me you know to continue down this path because I know that people are waking up and I know we're seeing change and, and change in a positive direction well it definitely highlights the importance of having independent media and then so as someone who you know you did work with the mainstream media you still kind of contribute and being on that side of it you know, it's our job as journalists to check those in power. What do you think about the fact that so many journalists are now going to work for the White House, for the Obama administration? Uh, I, you know, I, I take the uh, belief of Seymour Hirsch, who recently wrote an op-ed in The Guardian, and he said, in order to change the mainstream media, what you're going to have to do is fire potentially 90 percent of editors and, and producers. And, and I believe with him, or I, I believe in him and what he's saying, because uh, so many of these journalists have lost sight of the true meaning of journalism. And I'm not saying they're bad people, but they've just really lost sight of the fact that we are in this game as journalists to be watchdogs on authority, not to be lapdogs. And so many journalists, especially in Washington, D.C., have such cozy relationships with authority that they're not questioning them. Just watch any White House press conference. The journalists sit back like lap dogs and, and take orders when really they should be constantly pressing the government for, for answers. And, and so I just think that 
right now these these outlets are filled with people who have lost sight of journalism and um, you know it's time to clean house and, and start over and that's what the independent press is doing and we're seeing that it's working because viewers and readers are now moving over to these outlets and abandoning the mainstream because they are waking up to the fact that and that's just not journalism anymore, unfortunately. And for me, coming from the mainstream, that used to be so upsetting because I'd want to see my colleagues asking more difficult questions. And instead, I had several of my colleagues actually contact me on behalf of government officials, um, telling me I needed to include their response or complaining about a story I did, which really uh, I, I couldn't believe at the time. And so I, I lost faith for a brief period in the mainstream thinking that uh, journalism had died. And fortunately, when I came out to the independent press and saw how many amazing muckrakers had left or had just uh, risen out of the, the independent press uh, successfully to do real journalism, it gave me a lot of hope because journalism is alive and well. You just have to really search for it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, your stories have been silenced before in the past, but let's say this is your new segment here. What do you think is the b most important story? What should we be talking about right now? Uh, I think we're facing a mental health epidemic worldwide. Uh, I, I think that the anxiety of realizing the reality of, of the world and, and the lies and, and the deceit uh, has have really created that and, and just our lifestyle in general, our, our, our food choices. Um, it's really just created a mental health epidemic of anxiety and depression that has turned so many people into zombies. And um, unfortunately, one of their only options are these prescription medications, which only exacerbate the problem, lead to disassociation, um, lead to uh, addiction as well. So, so for me, journalistically, I, I've realized that we need to come up with a solution to this because it's, it's become a nightmare that's, that's paralyzing the country. So I've been working to investigate natural medicines that exist. Mother Nature, as I've learned, I used to be a skeptic, skeptic but Mother Nature has given us the tools to, to cure nearly every illness we have in our bodies, including mental illness. And these cures, these natural cures are out there. And the industry knows about them, the government knows about them, but unfortunately the majority of the people aren't aware that these cures are there because they're being suppressed and they're being uh, demonized or made illegal because the industry can't profit from them because they can't be patented. And so I think it's really important to expose these options and solutions um, to really try to take the nation out of this, uh, we're just at a standstill, I think mentally a lot of people are just stuck and to give them options to, to heal their disorders and become productive uh, citizens. Well, exactly. They've got us all convinced that we need to get our health in pill form, that we can only get it if it's a prescription pill, when, when most of those pills are derived from plants. So why don't we just go directly to the source of what it is that's actually healing us and figure out, you know, and rather than destroy the rainforest and everything that we don't even know what's out there yet, why don't we see how these plants are helping us and, and how we can use them? Because I agree, Mother Nature has the cure for everything. If we just would stop <laughs> fighting against it. So you've actually been in doing a, some really in-depth investigation for, I guess, the last year on uh, some different things that are healing people that we're just now learning. You know, I, I believe it was CNN that's actually been reporting about uh, you know marijuana and also um, saying that uh, psychedelics actually make the brain grow and are helping, maybe that's what had us evolve and marijuana is helping with seizures and cancer and things like that. So why do you think we have such a stigma here in the US because it's been classified as a drug that they want to control? Okay. Well, we're facing a, a big amount of confusion in the United States right now between what is medicine and what is drug. And unfortunately, a lot of our medicines actually behave as drugs, whereas things that are being labeled drugs as, as in marijuana and psychedelics are actually medicines. Mm -hmm. And that means 
that the more you take these, the less you need. And they actually do cure the root cause of the problem versus just treating the symptom and they're non-addictive. And, and psychedelics have incredible power to not only lead to neurogenesis, which is uh, creating new brain cells, but also to, to cure uh, the brain from um, anxiety, depression, and, and other, other uh, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> we're having some noise in the background in here, and, and, and other illnesses. And, um, and, and when I say cure, some people are, are taking these medicines, and within two days, they consider it to be 30 years of therapy, Within two days, they're they're cured. Uh, whereas if they were to go the traditional route and take these prescription medications, they w- would never be cured. The medicines just cure the symptoms or just treat the symptoms, and then oftentimes leave these individuals uh, worse off than they were before and and potentially addicted to the to these medicines. And it's because marijuana and psychedelics are so powerful. And so they have such tremendous ability to heal that they're being made illegal because they can't be patented and therefore the industry cannot profit off of them. And I consider the lack of availability of these medicines for the main public to be one of the greatest human rights crises of of the last 40 years. And so I've decided to devote my, my to regulations, um, making people aware that there are solutions out there. Um, a lot of people are trapped in the prisons of their minds and, and feel like there's no hope because these medicines have given them no hope. And, and there are solutions out there. Right. It is such a shame. I mean, I can speak from experience. My father had to go through chemotherapy and they gave him all sorts of, you know, pain pill, pills and everything. And he lost, I mean, he weighed less than I do. It was really frightening. The only thing that helped him was medical marijuana. He was on no pain medicine. I mean, it was incredible. He could eat. So, I mean, that right there was proof enough for me because he went from a skeleton back to the healthy man that he has always been. So I know you're in Sydney. You're taking a break, kind of working on uh, your next book. Do you want to tell us what's up next? Yeah, so I'm just uh, just sitting down and hunkering down and gathering pages and pages of notes and trying to make it <laughs> make sense. Um, and and so uh, so I'm, I'm writing this book on on natural medicines and and showing people how they can access them. And so um, hopefully, <laughs> if I'm able to to make sense of everything I've seen over the past year quickly enough, uh, the book will come out next year. Um, so that, that's really been my main focus now, as well as really um, promoting uh, my book that just came out, Peace, Love, and Pepper Spray, because I, I feel like that's a book that could go on um, and should go on coffee tables all across the nation to really remind people of the beauty of protest and, and give people something intelligent to, to talk about in their living room conversations. You now all you gotta do is open the book and it will instantly ignite some kind of conversation, whether it be political or um, <laughs> or, or heated, for that matter. But but at least it's getting the word out there, and that's reminding people that protest is beautiful, and we need protest if, if we want change in the United States. Right, exactly. Get people talking. Get you and your family talking about something that's real. Uh, Obama wants us to uh, <laughs> talk about Obamacare with our families this Christmas. So. That's definitely a much more interesting coffee table book, in my opinion. Well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so that's at peaceloveandpepperspray.com. People can pick that up for a wonderful Christmas gift and on into the new year. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> Amber, thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to whatever you've got coming up next, and we'll definitely have you back. Wonderful, and thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure. All right, well, you heard it right there from a three-time Emmy-winning investigative journalist. The independent media is so vital. So please do what you can to support independent media and become a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. We are running a New Year's, Christmas New Year's special. I believe Alex said he's going to run this on through February. You can get five months free if you sign up today. And of course, if you get that today, you'll still have time to make that an excellent stocking stuffer for your friends and family. So thank you for joining us here tonight. We'll be back again weekdays at 7 p.m. Central. Well, it used to be if you wanted to let your neighbors know about a lost dog or even trying to sell a car, you'd just come to your local community board. 
Well, nowadays, neighborhoods are relying on Nextdoor.com. It's a social networking app. It's kind of like Facebook, but it's for just you and your neighbors. Have you heard about Nextdoor.com? I have not heard about Nextdoor.com. Enlighten um, me. Have you ever heard of it? No, what's that? It's basically like a Facebook, but for neighborhoods. Are you familiar with the new Neighborhood Watch? It's kind of an online neighborhood watch that's pretty big here in Austin. It's called Nextdoor. They just received $60 million of uh, invest investment money from Amazon, Google, Facebook, and George Tennant's company. George Tennant? The former director of the CIA. Really? I had no idea about that, and I think it's bad, yeah. definitely. Especially with everything, you know, like the NSA, all that stuff. What has George Tennant got to do with me? <laughs> He's a big investor in Nextdoor.com. I mean, are you comfortable inviting him to your, your barbecue? No, and it's amazing that he's working directly with Google and these big corporations. Anytime you have, um, you know, the private sector coming into things like surveillance and, you know, postage, military, I think that's great. I'm not going to make any judgments on it, so... Especially with this, like, pointing right in front of me, I really, I, I'm not going to say anything, so. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's the big issue, is that you might opt out of it, but your neighbors can sign you up for it. Well, that's awful, and it seems to fit in with a larger pattern of us being more and more surveilled in our society. I'm all for it. If you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have anything to worry about, right? One thing, we've taken the crabby old lady in the neighborhood and put her online now. So everything and anything you is out there. So you'd be okay with the Tattle app aspect of it as long as you could use it to your advantage to target groups that you don't like? That's absolutely correct. First thing that comes to mind, once you got big, big money and big government in, it, it kind of takes your flex away. Why do you need this repository for the information? Treat me like a neighbor and not as someone that you need to watch or spy on. It's, it's a philosophical thing that'll take much elbow banging and beer drinking at the local bar to settle out. Well, that was pleasantly surprising. It seems like a lot of people, at least here in Austin, are quite aware that we are under massive surveillance and it's gotten out of hand. It seems like those people at least are going to be opting out of the program if they can. But what can we do to let the rest of the country know that this particular neighborhood watch may have been co-opted by the CIA? Okay, fantastic. So we're going to go to break. When we come back in three minutes, we're going to go right to that. Can we help you, sir? Boom. Uh, no, we uh, just came in. We were out here covering some other stories. We just came in. Need to do it ahead of time. Yeah, How far ahead of time? Yeah, I apologize. Thank you. I mean, how, I mean, how far ahead of time do we need to fill out such things? Actually, if y'all are ready, we can. Sure. We can, I can give you an email address. Sure. And you, you can write that. Yeah. yeah. You ready? And you don't have to film me anymore either. Yeah, it's a job. I have to. It's uh, pretty, I'm pretty boring, huh? That's okay. We like boring. Okay, so well, I'll tell you, we're about to go live on air in just a second. Good. If you, if, I mean, maybe you could explain this and to so our you, viewers. May I ask who you're Oh, yeah, so we're with InfoWars.com. Oh, that's fine. And but who you're going to interview? Oh, we're trying to speak with uh, Mrs. Davis. So she also, I mean, her office the office is also aware of standard procedure. So, okay. You know, we, we want, we don't ever want to stand in anyone's way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to explain to you what you would do next time so that. Right. Austin. Austin. Yes, sir. Very nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. All right. I've been watching live feeds during the break. Even though he's doing it polite, is it nice? What has he now said to you? He's basically given us the address where we can seek permission to film here and... Yeah, but and, notice, and notice, notice there's no state police talking. The state police are not talking to you because that's made up. So ignore him and go in Wendy Davis's office. Where is that? It's right behind us. All right, go, go, go no, walk in there. My God, or let me talk to that idiot. Anyways, all right, so it's closed, it's gone. We're the press there showing it. Davis, is anybody available to make a statement on her behalf? There they are. How can we get in touch with her? Can we send a call or email? Or I see one of these business cards. Is that the best way? I mean, this way? guy literally is just trying to henpeck us out of there. The state police didn't stop him. You don't need, the media's in there every day and doesn't get permission. Okay, I'm sick of color of law crud. <laughs> Shit.
symbols are powerful and the globalists have hijacked the symbols of America. They've turned them into their own symbols. Well, we are restoring the idea of the true republic, not the counterfeit globalist empire by promoting the icon George Washington and others. That's why we're rolling out on a 100% made in America line of incredible pro-liberty apparel. We are repopularizing liberty. We are helping fellow Americans rediscover what made this country great. We are the spirit of 1776. We are 1776 worldwide. We are all brothers and sisters in arms in the animating contest of liberty in the long march towards humanity's ultimate destiny of freedom. Visit MadeIn1776.com today and vote with your dollars to promote truly made in America high quality products and promote the ideals of liberty.